All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, let's just make sure everything's working here. It's quite a few of you already. In fact, this is one of the larger uh, initial attendances that I think I've had. Uh, probably several reasons for that, which I'll get to in a moment. But I did want to preface the rest of the conversation today with the fact that I have a pretty bad head cold that I picked up traveling earlier this week. So uh, this may be a slightly abbreviated session relative to the usual hour plus. We'll see how it goes. I have some green tea in front of me. And if you, uh, if you hear me sneeze or do something else that you do with a head cold, uh, please forgive me, but it's uh, this is a live uncut hour, so the likelihood of me making it through the full hour without uh, sneezing or something like that is uh, is low. Uh, if the uh, if the hours so far today are any guide, uh, and you'll notice my my voice is probably about an octave lower than it usually is. Uh, anyway, just for some context, in case I end a little early or take a break where I mute myself briefly. Uh, so I think that there are several big reasons why, why today's attendance is high. Uh, one is that there is a genuinely interesting and potentially high impact storm pattern coming from two parts of the West Coast uh, in the coming days and weeks. Uh, interestingly, this looks like a pattern that may have the largest impacts way up north in British Columbia and then also way down south in Southern California with fewer impacts, the whole segment of the West Coast in between. So uh, this is actually going to be a, a, a very reminiscently El Nino-like pattern with some very warm atmospheric river, Pineapple Express atmospheric rivers up in British Columbia, with the potential for some really serious flooding up there and on Vancouver Island and in parts of the Pacific Northwest more broadly, mainly in Washington, not, as, not so much in Oregon. And then again, an active storm pattern developing a little bit later in five to seven days from now across California really increasingly look like it's going to target Southern California. So central really from about the Santa Barbara coast southward, this could be a pretty big event, uh, a very El Nino-like event in almost every respect, actually, uh, the kind of event that we have uh, arguably been waiting for. Uh, and this is exactly the time of year when we thought it might be most likely to occur. You may mention that I you may recall that I had earlier mentioned that the season would most likely be backweighted and the strongest relationship between uh, precipitation in California and El Nino would occur and has historically occurred for physical reasons we understand between about January and March. Well, looks like this a pattern is going to emerge in early February, so right smack dab in the middle of that window. So I'll get to all of that in a moment. The other thing uh, that I think many of you are interested in hearing about today is some of the misinformation that is swirling online regarding the potential for a uh, genuinely catastrophic flood event in California. And I just want to, before I even uh, pause for a moment and, and come back to that later, I just want to emphasize that there is not currently any indication whatsoever of an extremely severe statewide, statewide catastrophic uh, flood event resulting from a multi-sequence, a multi-week sequence of storms similar to that in what is known as the arc storm scenario. Now I'll get into what the arc storm scenario is and isn't. It is a real thing, but it is not something that is headed for California imminently. It is something that could happen in California and theoretically could happen in any given year but there are no specific indications right now that it's any more likely than it would normally be uh, at, during uh, sort of a midwinter period during an El Nino event. So there aren't any particularly alarming uh, indications of a statewide mega flood. However, there are indications of a potentially high impact storm pattern coming up. So why is it important to differentiate between these things is something I want to talk about and uh, a little bit of commentary on the state of weather and climate misinformation on, on social media. And uh, so those are the two main topics I'm going to be talking about in the hour. One other thing I wanted to lead with briefly, well, since there's been some discussion of this as well, is as many of you know, you know, I, I, I am a climate scientist and a meteorologist by training. You know, I, I actually have both backgrounds, which is a little bit unusual. It kind of allows me to have the, the kinds of conversations that I'm having right now with all of you uh, and in public because it allows me to span the weather climate interface in a way that is sometimes tricky and there are is often a lot of historical uh, inertia in institutions that study weather and climate that sort of separate 
uh, the two domains, the two disciplines, meteorology and climate science, even though, of course, in the end, it's all the same atmosphere operating under the same physics and the th same thermodynamics and the same chemistry. Now, of course, weather and climate are not the same thing, uh, but they sure as heck are related to one another, and we need uh, one to understand the other, it turns out, especially when the climate is changing. And I'm also, as you know, because I'm here talking to you today with several hundred people on the live stream right now, I'm a pretty public-facing uh, climate scientist and meteorologist, and my role is unusual in that it is a bit shoehorned into a traditional academic research science role within UCLA, and it turns out that that is an extraordinarily difficult uh, position to fund because there are no uh, funding opportunities for public facing weather and climate science. So all of the conversations that I have with folks, uh, all of the news interviews, all of the blog posts, all of the magazine articles, really how I spend upwards of 60 to 70 percent of my time uh, is not really fundable using traditional means in science. You can't go to the National Science Foundation or NOAA or NASA and say, hey, I've got a good research idea. Will you fund it? Um, I do pursue those kinds of grants, uh, but you're capped uh, often in how much of that you can actually receive. So really, long story short, uh, is I uh, am approaching uh, what could be a bit of a cliff uh, this summer in the ability to continue to do the kind of job that I've been doing for years. Uh, and it is essentially, I know it's boring, it's the thing I like talking about the least, but it is a funding problem. And at this point, we've explored a lot of options, and I've increasingly convinced that the primary mode of solutions will be uh, external institutions, uh, especially uh, private philanthropy, that are interested in supporting at least one uh, half-time uh, public sector science salary for multiple years. Uh, it could be more than one. There's a lot of amazing scientists, communicators out there who we could help if, if there was interest in doing more. Uh, but that is uh, something that I am actively soliciting. So if you happen to be a, a, an officer at a charitable foundation and are interested in this, or if you are uh, even uh, somebody who's capable of, of addressing this on their own independently, please do reach out because the next six months are going to be critical in that regard. And I think We've explored a lot of options through the development team and through crowdsourcing, and in the end, I just don't think those are going to scale up to meet the challenge. So I think we need larger scale solutions, and we need them fast. So that's all I'll say about that. If you, uh, you or someone you know uh, have ideas, specific ideas, um, since we've pursued, I've literally had hundreds of conversations about this at this point, and none of them have come to fruition. This is my, I'm just leveraging my platform to network a bit. So uh, I won't have any more to say about that right now. Uh, move on to the weather and climate, but I did want to throw that out there. All right. Uh, so to get back to the weather, or, or maybe actually to return to something that it has been talked a lot about online, but isn't actually happening, uh, is the hubbub over whether or not the, quote, arc storm is coming to California next week. And if you've been on TikTok, or if you've been following certain Twitter accounts, you might well believe that California is going to get washed off the map in the next 7 to 10 days. And again, although there is a wet to even very wet pattern for some parts of the state on the horizon, there is absolutely no indication of an extremely severe or catastrophic statewide flood event as has been rumored. Where are these rumors coming from? What does the term arc storm mean? Well, arc storm is actually a real uh, thing, but what it is, is not a specific storm. It's not a weather prediction for what might be happening next week or the week after or any other specific period in time, but it's a potential hypothetical scientific and disaster preparedness scenario that was developed originally back in 2010 by a consortium of scientists within California, Nevada, and the U.S. Geological Survey to sort of pose the question, is California prepared for flood events more severe and more widespread than what we've seen in the 20th century? Uh, that we have all of our built infrastructure where most of our cities have built and sprawled out, uh, where our flood control infrastructure has been uh, tested against storms of lesser caliber, but not of this magnitude or duration. Even though we know from the paleoclimate record that extremely severe flood events in California do tend to occur with some regularity on millennial timescales. In fact, they happen 
about five to 10 times per millennium or once every one to 200 years or so. Now, there is no actual cyclicity to that. There is no specific period where you'd expect it to happen exactly every 100 years or every 200 years. That's just on average, if you sum up over, over centuries and millennia, how often it looks like it happens. It could happen this year, it could happen next year, it might not happen for 50 or 60 years, uh, but that was the basis and motivation. And for those of you such students of history who've heard about the Great Flood of 1862, that is a partial model for the original arc storm scenario completed in 2010. By the way, this was designed initially by many of the same folks of the US Geological Survey who have actually implemented other successful California disaster scenarios. If you've ever, uh, in your job or at school, uh, ducked under a desk uh, during an earthquake drill or participated in the Great California Shakeout or have any knowledge of what's known as the Haywired Scenario, which is this Bay Area-specific earthquake preparedness drill and scenario, these are the same folks at the USGS who I've worked with uh, on ArcStorm 2.0, which was something that we started about five years back uh, and really got some momentum a couple of years ago, uh, last year, it, or in 2022, when we published our initial findings on the actual, the, the updated scenario itself using revised methods and incorporating climate change because the original scenario in 2010, unfortunately did not incorporate anything about climate change. It was actually still uh, a pretty politically controversial thing to even be talking about that in the state of California at the at governmental uh, agencies at the time. It just shows you uh, how we, we have come a long way in the last 10 or 20, 15 years. But anyway, ArcStorm 2.0 is still underway in some sense, but the first big paper came out, you, you, this is before I was doing the YouTube live sessions, but I have a nice blog post that you can read. You can read the peer-reviewed paper. It's all open access. There are Twitter threads. I think there were almost 500 news media articles written about the paper when it came out. The point being, uh, this is a scenario. It's a hypothetical, plausible worst case, not the absolute worst case, mind you, but something that we really think could happen, uh, and it wouldn't be the 10,000 year event or the 100,000 year event. This isn't some you know, meteor hitting Earth kind of likelihood. This is something that probably uh, has a recurrence interval of no more than a couple hundred years, and with climate change, potentially a lot less than that. In fact, we already found in this paper that we published in 2020 that the odds of an arc storm-like event have probably already doubled quietly in the background uh, in the 20th century that we've been more concerned with drought and flood. Now, they st the likelihood still remains low in any given year, whether that's this year or any other year. It's also possible in any year. And this, these odds have sort of it, it doubled quietly in the background because you know if you double the odds from uh, one in 100 odds to one in 50 odds, which is kind of the territory we're talking about, that's a huge relative change. That's a 100% increase in the likelihood in any given year, but you still could, on average, go 40 or 50 years without seeing one, uh, even under that doubling. So my point is, just because we haven't seen it recently doesn't mean that the odds haven't increased uh, while we weren't looking and while we were sort of out of sight, out of mind. So that's the context for this. And we've produced these papers and we're still, uh, unfortunately, with, with the current state budget, it's going to be harder for us to actually do the statewide inundation and flood modeling that we want to with ArcStorm 2.0. But we do have this initial paper out there. There is ongoing work, partners uh, at the California Department of Water Resources, the Desert Research Institute, uh, me at UCLA, and then a couple of folks at NCAR in Boulder, Colorado as well, are all working on this. And I think it's important work because it's one of the big potential natural hazards that California is most likely to be blindsided by. Everyone knows about the earthquake hazard, and then after the last decade, everyone is acutely aware of the wildfire hazard. But the mega flood sort of uh, potential, I think, is still under, be un under the radar. And so some folks have taken it upon themselves uh, on the internet to make uh, claims that, and this has now happened, I believe, every year since Arc Storm Scenario was first put out there. I, I know, speaking with my colleagues, this happened back in 2010. Of course, the internet was a different place back in 2010, and misinformation spreads even faster today than it did back then. And it's happened uh, in 2022, in 2023, and now again in 2024, where somebody claims that the Arc Storm 2.0 is now out there lurking in the Pacific somewhere uh, without any actual evidence. And these claims go viral, they get millions of views, and sometimes folks double down, insisting uh, that, uh, that this thing is out there and that the meteorologists are just trying to 
somehow uh, cover their butts. I'm not even quite sure how that works uh, in retrospect. But anyway, even uh, pointing out that I personally designed the Arcstorm 2.0 scenario along with Chinying Kwong, uh, apparently wasn't enough to get folks uh, to understand that I, I could pretty confidently say that there's no indication that something like that is on the immediate horizon right now. Uh, so suffice it to say, I don't want to really give too much more uh, oxygen to all of that than it already has, which is to say far, far too much. Uh, but it's, I, I don't think it's acceptable to pretend that a potentially catastrophic event is right around the corner when there's absolutely no evidence that it actually is. Uh, some folks have said that it is appropriate in the name of preparedness, but if you speak to anybody who understands uh, communicating with the public, uh, natural hazard science, uh, disaster science, emergency management, or any of the other relevant disciplines, you will find that this is very possibly the worst thing you could conceivably do uh, to actually increase the credibility of scientists and communicators and therefore actual preparedness for something that genuinely could happen, and I would even wager eventually will happen. Most of us alive today will live, will live to see an event like this in California, but the odds of it happening this year remain very low, and the odds of it happening in the next two weeks are close to zero. Uh, so I just really want to reemphasize that this is a hypothetical scenario for which there is no particular evidence that it's going to happen imminently, even though technically it could happen in any given year, and the odds are rising in a warming climate. And I do think that California needs to be better prepared for these sorts of things, and I also think that certain state agencies are still a little bit behind and are not as prepared as they could be for events like this. Uh, and the general public is perhaps a little more attuned to wildfire and even earthquake hazard than flood hazard. Uh, but in general, it's still uh, just to uh, reassure folks that despite the potential for significant flooding even in the next couple of weeks, that is actually a real possibility in some parts of the state, as I'll get to in a moment, uh, the arc storm is still, even given that all of that, not on the horizon at the moment. All right, I'm going to take a sip of green tea. You may briefly see an ad while I pause. Uh, just give me a moment here uh, before I launch in to the next thing, which is going to be about what actually is on the horizon. And there is a lot of interesting stuff to talk about there. I'll have some visuals to show you as well. All right, thanks for bearing with me there for my brief commercial and green tea and sneeze break. Let's see. Oh, it looks like uh, some folks are saying there was a, a decent little shaker up in the North A by the, the Geysers Geothermal Plant 4.2, which is, it is, that is a bit larger than you usually get. There's a lot of uh, twos and threes up there, near the, the geologically active uh, geothermal field up there, but four, four is definitely something you're going to feel, so several folks are commenting on that now. Uh, if anything crazy ever does happen during one of these live streams, uh, do feel free to put it in there and I can try and talk about it live. All right, so... Let's see here. So what I really want to talk about is this large scale pattern first uh, over the Pacific, which is looking uh, pretty darn in interesting. And uh, by the way, I, I just swapped microphones. So if for some reason uh, the sound isn't coming through, let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to proceed. Well, you can see on screen here right now, again, this is uh, the, the nifty uh, tropical tidbit site run by Dr. Levi Cohen. Uh, he is somebody else who actually uh, had a really cool weather website uh, before uh, getting full professional credentials, but now has a PhD in meteorology, I believe. So it's a site I like to support 
uh, it is free, and again, uh, it is ad-supported with some charitable contributions, so it's always nice to contribute. Uh, but one of the reasons I like it is you can get visualizations like this uh, that are really nice uh, way of looking at the broad picture uh, over really the whole North Pacific here. And and I think, I think let me just double check that you can see the, the cursor. Uh, I think you can see my cursor uh, on screen. So what is really readily apparent here, and you may recognize this again from earlier in the year, this is the analysis. So this is essentially right now or just a few hours ago. There's a very, very strong uh, Pacific jet, jet extension uh, occurring. And right now it's at a latitude uh, around central or southern California. So this is a, a good 500 or, or 1,000 miles even south of the previous jet extension. Uh, back in December, that kind of uh, didn't quite produce the goods for most of California. We did get a locally record-breaking rainfall event in Ventura out of it, but we didn't get anything uh, too crazy. But this one is actually looking more promising, especially for Southern California, uh, because A, it's at a lower latitude, and B, it looks like it's going to hold together better as it approaches the coast. So I'm just going to step through. I'm actually going to convert to the the uh, the European ensemble, or actually, you know what? I'll go for the American ensemble because that one has finished processing in its most recent update cycle. Uh, you're going to get rough with the same picture here, uh, but as you can see, uh, this 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 jet extension over the over the next few days. This is now about five days out. It is getting really close to California, and at, and at that point, starts to punch through. In fact, it actually makes landfall in uh, central Baja California. Uh, so this is this is making this is holding itself together and ending up much farther south than the last one did. And now you can see this is uh, this is valid in about about a week from now, uh, the early February uh, Friday night on uh, February second. Is you can see this strong Pacific zonal jet. And again, this is an ensemble average, so it will probably be stronger than this. This is just smoothed out a bit on the ensemble. Uh, the what you see is this this really coherent and linear feature uh, extending all the way across the basin, and central and southern California are in this favorable uh, position just north of the jet core uh, for some really active weather and significant storms to potentially develop. So I'm actually I am going to transition over to the the older uh, European ensemble because it's a little bit easier to tell what's going on. Um, as we head into early February, this this jet st uh, streak uh, it, it just it, it continues uh, to to sort of persist all the way across the Pacific and making landfall right in northern to central Baja. This again puts central and southern California in this favorable region uh, for storms to develop, uh, a strongly baroclinic zone. So if I uh, if I bring up, I guess uh, that's really not what I wanted to see here. Let's see if we can. Uh, bring up the the height anomaly here. Yeah. So uh, excuse me for a moment. So if we if we sort of see, sequence through, we're going back in time to right now where there's some ridging. In fact, uh, by the way, between now and about Monday or Tuesday, it's going to be uh, unusually warm and dry. In fact, some parts of the West are going to see record warmth, including much of the Central Valley. Uh, on Monday, potentially. So it's going to get up into the 70s across a lot of California and much of the West. Really mild uh, late January, early, Febr uh, early February temperatures before this happens. Uh, but then what you see is this initial storm, uh, it, 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 it starts to make some real progress towards California uh, right on, around February 1st. Uh, and then a sequence of additional storms just keep building. You get deeper and deeper storms favoring uh, Central and Southern California. This is a very favorable location for significant storms uh, and major storm activity over the Southern California Bight. So this is really a favorable storm pattern. As you can see, it persists for a while. You know, this is the ensemble average going out to February 9th. Uh, the pattern starts to fade a bit as we get towards mid-February, but we have a solid 10 days of very favorable conditions for major storm activity in Central and Southern California. Um, 
All right, so the other thing I want to point out uh, is, and here uh, I'm going to go to the precipitable water uh, and normalized anomalies. This is saying, essentially, in relative terms, throughout the whole atmospheric column, how much more or less moisture is there at a given place at a given time than there usually is. So what do you notice uh, in this map? Well, there's this really deep plume of moisture going back all the way to the Hawaiian Islands, extending way up into southeastern Alaska, British Columbia, and the Pacific Northwest. So this happens later this weekend, Sunday into Monday, a very strong atmospheric river, a Pineapple Express, warm and wet uh, delivery of subtropical moisture directly into British Columbia. <laughs> this has the potential to produce a, a very heavy rainfall event, something that you would only see every uh, 10 to 30 years, perhaps. Uh, up in parts of British Columbia, up in, uh, on Vancouver Island, and making things worse is that this is going to be a very warm event, so there will be significant snowmelt adding to potentially record-breaking rainfall, so major flooding is possible, uh, at least in some places up in BC or on Vancouver Island around next Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, especially because there's a sequence, and as you can see, that, that very major, major warm, wet atmospheric river moves through, uh, and then there's another one uh, just behind it on Tuesday. Now, this is the one that is going to make a little more progress, likely, and I'm going to bring up the European Ensemble once again here for, for since it's actually showing a stronger system. This is the event right at the end of January, January 31st, that although the, the surface low is likely to end up uh, making landfall somewhere in BC, you can see it's going to drag a pretty strong and moist cold front atmospheric river. This will be a Pineapple Express type system uh, into California, and this one will make it into California, as you can see, going into next Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, but if this were the only storm in the sequence, it would be notable, but not that impressive. But really what's interesting, so that's just the precursor, that initial warm and wet storm in California could bring significant impacts, especially in Southern California. <laughs> but the, uh, the real uh, interesting thing is what happens next. So we get rid of the warm and wet systems, but as you can see, look at this persistent low pressure and slightly elevated moisture content near Southern California during this period, as I mentioned earlier. This is a point where I probably want to zoom in a little bit more on the Western US uh, and in Southern California in particular. Uh, so what we've got going on here is most of California is going to be completely dry, uh, except for the northwestern corner for the next five days. Dry and warm, so uh, the next five days, uh, no arc storm and no really anything else. It's just going to be warm and sunny. Uh, but things change pretty quickly around next, late next Tuesday into Wednesday. Again, this is an ensemble average. You see that this, this initial warm and wet storm sweeps uh, north to south across California, so everybody from the Oregon border to the Mexican border should get some rain with this. Snow levels will be high. This will not be a good snow producer. It also won't be an extremely wet event, but it looks reasonably wet, and coastal areas, even the lower elevations, could see an inch or two, a solid inch or two, with some more and higher elevations. But again, this won't be all that extraordinary in its own right. But look at what happens to the accumulated precipitation going forward into February, especially in Southern California. Uh, this really ramps up a lot to the point where some parts of the coast, and again, uh, these models are not able to resolve the, co the, the, the extremely tall transverse ranges and, and, and mountains in Southern California. So uh, this is likely a, a gross underestimate of the actual amount of rain that would fall in this pattern in the mountains. So to see a prediction for three to maybe even uh, up to six inches along the actual uh, coast in a widespread fashion in Southern California over a, a less than 10 day period, that's a pretty strong signal. Uh, in fact, if you look uh, at the seven-day precipitation anomaly from the European model, uh, it sort of peaks at in very wet territory. So this is a pattern uh, for Central and Southern California uh, that looks, uh, and also for Northern Baja, in fact, maybe even particularly for far Northern Baja, just south of the, of the border. Um, this, is, this has the potential for some significant flooding, and it's too early to tell. This is an ensemble average. It will depend on the details. I'll be following this. I will have a blog post on this next week and probably another YouTube live session. But 
Uh, this is the kind of pattern that does look a little bit concerning for some potentially significant flood risk, at least in some parts of Southern California. I don't think this is a particularly concerning pattern for flood risk in the northern half or even the northern two-thirds of the state. This just isn't going to be enough water. In fact, the amount of precipitation in the next couple of weeks along, say, the north coast probably isn't even going to be all that extraordinary, but it does look like it may be notable in coastal Southern California from about uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara County, southward. That's really where the lion's share of the anomalous precipitation will be, which is precisely where you'd expect it to be during a strong El Nino event. So that's uh, kind of interesting to see it finally. <laughs> All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is this is a pattern that is potentially conducive to some other kinds of hazards too. Uh, in addition to the heavy rain in Southern California, this is a pattern that could produce strong surface lows with strong winds. So some wind damage is possible uh, because the jet stream will be quite dynamic. And it's also a pattern that's favorable for relatively uh, robust thunderstorm activity. So I would not be surprised at times to see occasional outbursts of some thunderstorms or even some, some, some severe weather. Uh, coastal water spouts, weak tornadoes, stronger wind gusts, and torrential downpours. In fact, we could even see a repeat of the kinds of uh, r rather extreme flash flood events that have now occurred twice in Southern California this winter. In Ventura, where over three inches of rain fell in an hour overnight back in December, and then San Diego, uh, which happened earlier this week, again, the, pro the product of extremely intense thunderstorm downpours that caused major flash flooding. In fact, it's, it's, it's something of a miracle that nobody died in those events because there were lots of images in San Diego of quite a few cars uh, being uh, trapped and then uh, being washed into uh, culverts and washes all around the city. So that was a pretty damaging flood event. Um, I might be able to talk about that a little bit at the end, so if somebody wants to ask me a question about that, that would be a good candidate for discussing further. But part of it is because there is so much anomalously warm water near the California coast. That adds both moisture, of course, to the lower atmosphere, but also makes the lower atmosphere a little bit unstable, more unstable than it would normally be. So that on its own is not enough for heavy, heavy downpours that cause uh, unusual or even record-breaking flooding. but when you have a storm come along and you have a jet streak overhead like we did near San Diego uh, earlier this week, like we did uh, over Ventura County back in December, and as we will at least once or twice during this upcoming pattern somewhere in Southern California or Northern Baja, something like that could happen again. And that's important because some parts of Southern California, especially down in San Diego County, are still drying out from this last event. So soils are actually quite wet, not everywhere, but in some places, uh, definitely so. So you can see this is not an this this is a pattern that won't be terrible for Sierra Nevada precipitation. There'll probably be near to slightly above average precipitation during this pattern, but it won't be exceptional. And I was just up at South Lake Tahoe earlier this week for Operation Sierra Storm. For those of you familiar, uh, it's where I picked up my cold. But it's also where I stood outside for hours in the rain doing TV interviews. Yes, you heard that right. In the rain at 6,200 feet elevation in uh, late January. Um, it may or may not be related to the head cold, but the reason I bring it up is mainly because uh, the the warmth up there, uh, the fact that it was raining multiple, I was only there for three or four days, and on three of those days it rained at lake level at about 6,200 feet in elevation. So it was snowing up the mountain. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, you know, up at nine, ten thousand feet, at the top of the chairlift, uh, there was plenty of Sierra cement. Although it was kind of like spring, spring skiing, it was uh, slushy. But the reason I say this is the snowpack is still only around fifty to sixty percent of average in the mountains. It's not catastrophically bad, but it also isn't great. And the initial part of this pattern, let me go to temperatures now, uh, is not necessarily go is not not good at all for accumulating. In fact, this is the near to uh, record warmth over the next uh, five or six days that you see, in fact, it looks very warm across the whole domain here, pretty much. Uh, that's going to melt some Sierra snow, you get some sunlight on it, and then right as these initial storm, the first storm is going to be warm and wet. So that might be rain up at even eight and 9,000 feet, so definitely more rain at South Lake Tahoe. But look at what happens as we go farther and farther into February during the storm cycle is things cool off pretty dramatically. 
Um, actually, temperatures end up significantly below average as we go towards early to mid-February. I'll show you what this looks like in terms of the 850 millibar temperatures, which is often a good indication of snow level. Actually, let me bring up the absolute values rather than the anomalies there. I think I can do that. Uh, maybe I can't do that uh, here. Um, I need It needs to be... Well, I guess I can only get the anomalies in this plot. Anyway, the point is, we go from well above average uh, upper level temperatures, which this is going back in time towards the next few days, super, super warm, maybe even record warm, and then we and then we slowly transition towards much below average. So that's going to be the part of the pattern where there is going to be a much better potential for snow accumulation in the mountains, including at lake level or below. So I think you may lose some snow before you gain it, but on the other hand, I do think on the back end of this pattern, you might gain a meaningful amount. In fact, we may end up uh, better than we are now. So I think that snowpack at the end of this pattern will probably be above the 50 to 60% that it is uh, now. How much above? Maybe it's just a marginal gain, but I don't think it'll be a net loss, and it could be a significant net gain depending on how things go. <coughs> There's the sneeze I promised everybody. Based on my rate of sneezing today. It's kind of remarkable it's only been one so far. All right, uh, so have for some more green tea. So one thing I wanted to point out, one last thing here, is if we look at the total accumulated precipitation over this period from, that's not the right thing, Okay, so actually, I was going to say how the, the American model, the GFS, was drier than the European ensemble, but actually, in its most recent cycle, it's trended towards the European model, meaning wetter, especially in coastal Southern California. This is a very strong signal for this part of the world. Just to compare these two. <coughs> All right, here come the sneezes. All right, so the only the main reason I brought that up is the European ensemble is a little more going ho for a very wet pattern in coastal Southern California. These are some pretty eyeball uh, uh, popping numbers. Uh, the, the GF, the American ensemble, is uh, a little bit less so, but still trending quite wet and actually wetter than it was before. So I actually think that the European model solution is more likely to be right. So we could be looking at some significant impacts in Southern California beginning in about five to seven days. So stay tuned for that. One other thing uh, I wanted to illustrate. This is uh, what is known as a mediogram. And it is essentially, uh, it can be difficult to interpret at first glance, but uh, once you get to understand it, it's a piece of cake. Just look at each horizontal line on this, and there are 51 of them as an individual member from the European model ensemble. So there are literally 51 members, including the control run. And each of these is an independent replication of a predicted sequence of weather for the next 16 days. Uh, and each one is essentially equally likely as any other one. All that they do is perturb the initial conditions. So essentially, this is just a, a measure of how much uncertainty in the, in the initial atmospheric observations contributes to uh, essentially divergence in forecasts. So the first thing you can see is how wide the divergence is. This is why I always advocate for people to look at ensembles and to look at the full distribution, not just look at the average value or to look at a single value, but to look at the whole thing. This is a very good illustration of why that's important. So this is for a model grid box. This is the cumulative precipitation. So each horizontal band essentially represents the amount of precipitation that would accumulate in a coarse box near Los Angeles over the 16 day period. And each of these is a different representation of different accumulations that might be plausible over the next 16 days. Again, this is the same model run at the same time with slightly different initial conditions. And the very bottom thing down here that I'm uh, highlighting with my cursor now uh, is the average across all of these. So when you talk about the ensemble mean, this is what the, this is sort of what that represents. What is interesting, there's several things that are interesting. One is the ensemble mean uh, is, is almost five inches for Los Angeles over the, over the next uh, 16 days, and all of that falls after February 1st. This is actually in a 10-day period, an average of five inches of rain across all the members. Uh, that's a lot. 
for Los Angeles. So this, even the ensemble average, would be uh, pretty uh, a pretty significant event unto itself, which is why I'm highlighting the potential for some significant elevated flood risks because there is a reasonable chance of getting an amount of water that is is is, is noteworthy uh, it, during this period in Southern California. But then I want to highlight some of the outliers. So look at this one. In this particular model member, it rains uh, a little less than an inch during the initial storm and then doesn't rain at all ever again for the whole rest of the period. And the total for the 16 days ends up under one inch just from that one initial warm storm. But then if you look at this member here, uh, well, that's sort of a holy crap one for uh, if I ever saw one because we get uh, two inches of rain from that initial warm storm and then it gets worse. Then it just keeps coming and coming and coming. And after, uh, this is in about a six day period, uh, in this particular model ensemble member, uh, the LA area gets 12 inches of rain effectively. Uh, that would be a pretty big problem. That would be a major flood kind of scenario. Still not arc storm, but it would be a major kind of flooding situation. But then again, this one would not even register on the radar. In fact, we would actually could even end up below average precipitation for the month if this member came to be. Now, if you look at the range, there's a lot of members clustering between about four and six inches uh, as you go down by the end of this period. So, uh, you know, that's a pretty good indication that there's a fairly high likelihood of at least seeing four to five inches of rain in the LA area over a less than 10 day period. So although as much as even 12 inches is theoretically possible, as is as little as less than an inch, most members are pretty tightly clustered between about three and a half and five and a half inches, which is quite a bit, uh, and is enough on its own to cause some, some, some flooding issues. And of course, this doesn't take into account topography. So is it unusual for the mountains of Southern California to get a five inch rain event over, over 10 days in winter? No. But is it unusual for LAX to get that much? Yes, it is. And so this would translate probably uh, to two or three times as much water in the mountains as is represented here. So if there's four, four or five inches of rain in LA, I would not be at all surprised to see one to two feet of rain uh, up in the mountains in that kind of pattern, which is sort of where we get down to uh, the flood related potential here. So that's one indication. The other thing I wanted to point out here, uh, this is the same kind of plot, but for maximum wind gusts. And what I want to point out is that there is pretty high confidence that this initial storm is going to be windy. These are, these are coastal uh, wind gusts, and these are in nautical, oh no, sorry, these are actually in miles per hour. Uh, 30 to 40 mile an hour kinds of wind gusts, pretty high consensus. And then you can see scattered throughout different numbers, there's some that get up to 40, 50 miles an hour. So there are there is the potential for some stronger gusty winds. Right now, not seeing any obvious evidence of an extreme windstorm, but you never know. This is the kind of pattern that could produce a fairly decent one. So just wanted to throw that, that out there as well. Uh, and then I think maybe it's time to bring my face back. All right. So, uh, well, it turns out I'm on track to end up doing a full hour anyway, uh, but let me just see what questions I can get through quickly. Um, another sip of green tea first. All right, a question from Jacob Margolis from the beginning of the chat. And apologies, I, I do go through and read them from the beginning once I start taking questions usually. Uh, looking to provide context without fear-mongering, how much of a threat does this pose to the OC, LA, Ventura, Santa Barbara area? What should people anticipate? Are you concerned? Well, I think I've covered some of that. It's a little bit too early to be specific, but this pattern is one, as I meant, as you saw in the range of how much water could fall on, say, LAX, it ranges from a total non-issue to actually a considerable flood event. So uh, there is the potential for a significant flood event in Southern California, at least in some parts of Southern California, at some point in early to mid-February from this pattern. Whether or not it's actually gonna happen depends on a bunch of factors that are yet to be determined, but, but there is the potential there. Again, uh, that is not saying that there is any particular likelihood of an extremely severe or catastrophic flood event, but it is to say 
that when we start seeing ensemble averages in upper end outliers that are that large, especially given that it has been fairly wet in some parts of Southern California recently, that does give me pause. And the overall pattern of the jet stream and of the air masses that are, are sort of on the horizon right now are conducive to potentially producing the kinds of storms that, can, that have historically caused very heavy rainfall, uh, fairly widespread flooding, stronger wind storms, and even occasionally some severe thunderstorms. So think about those kinds of coastal water spouts or even uh, small tornadoes that move on shore. We've had a couple of those the last couple of years. This is the kind of pattern that might produce them again. So it's still early. You'll hear more about it next week. Uh, you have some like five days of potentially record warm and sunny weather to be uh, between now and then, and then a more moderate storm to start things off. Uh, but after that, uh, it may be after the races, so we'll just have to see. Uh, another question from Jacob uh, to follow up, whether all of this matches up with any of the models that we've put out, particularly around extreme or unprecedented rainfall. Uh, all right, I'm just going to convert this into a question uh, that is responsive to the recent San Diego uh, and Ventura events. Uh, as I mentioned, Ventura and San Diego have now both seen fairly localized, not super localized, sort of county scale uh, or, or half county scale, uh, extreme and even record breaking rainfall events this winter, short time scale. So we're not talking about big, wide atmospheric rivers that rained for days and produced a lot of water. We're talking about these really intense, sudden, somewhat localized downpours. And it turns out that both of these actually were thunderstorm downpours, so they were truly convective. In Ventura's case, it brought three inches of rain in an hour, which is actually, that's a phenomenal hourly rainfall rate for pretty much anywhere. I mean, that, that, that would actually cause problems even in places accustomed to big tropical downpours. San Diego's wasn't quite as intense. It was three to four inches over a couple hours, but the problem was that was over a wider and even more densely populated area that has even less history with extremely heavy downpours. So arguably, the San Diego event was actually more disruptive and probably has caused more damage, even though both were locally damaging. Uh, the short answer is yes, that in a warming climate, we should expect to see increasingly intense downpours. And the world has now warmed about 1.35 degrees centigrade. We know uh, that the amount uh, of, of water vapor that the atmosphere can potentially hold rises by about 7% per degree centigrade. So with 1.35 degree centigrade of warming, we should be a little over 10% in terms of the how much the uh, capacity of the atmosphere to hold water vapor has already increased due to global warming. Now, California has warmed more than the global average, as has the near shore uh, conditions in California, especially in an El Nino year. So if we take the uh, take into account climate change effect on increasing the amount of water vapor that the atmosphere can hold when it is saturated, uh, that probably makes events like this at least 10% more intense than they would be otherwise. Uh, we add the effect of El Nino, which uh, is sort of on top of that, maybe another 10%. And then we ask whether there are any nonlinear factors that, that could be involved. So I would say 10% is kind of the floor uh, on how much I would expect that global warming already has made these sorts of extreme downpours more light, uh, more intense. But it's probably more than 10%, in all honesty, because there's evidence that for convective extremes, for thunderstorm downpours that last uh, an hour, only on the order of three hours or less, and for the very most intense rainfall events, that the effect is actually greater than that 7% per degree centigrade increase in temperature would suggest. So that for the very most intense short duration rainfall events, there is evidence from around the world that actually that should increase even faster than 7% per degree centigrade of warming, maybe even closer to double. So I would say that in general, you know, 10 to 15% is a good estimate in terms of how much of the uh, rainfall increment was more intense than it would have been. But then that gets to an interesting question about impacts because, you know, if the reality is a storm drain or a culvert has a finite capacity. Uh, and if you, you know, if you increase the, the, the water volume, and by the way, a 10% increase in rain rates is not only a 10% increase in volume, but the whole point uh, is that uh, storm, you know, when, when there are watersheds, you concentrate water from a broad area into a narrow area. So often a 10% increase in rainfall rate uh, over a certain area can actually translate to a much greater than 10% increase in the volume. And then we also have systems, culverts, storm drains, whatever they are, flood channels, built to a particular standard. They are as big as they are. 
And once you start exceeding that channel capacity, all, all hell breaks loose, essentially. And so there is a built-in threshold. If the water is completely contained within the channel, then your impacts might be minimal. The second it starts to get out of the channel, even by a little bit, then you start to see massive erosion and damage and cars getting washed away and people's homes and apartments being flooded at high velocity and people seeing water rescues and people get washed into these channels. So, you know, this is a, actually a very good example of how relatively seemingly incremental increases, you know, in a warming climate can actually have big increases uh, in the impacts. So, uh, and the way the frequency works for very rare events, a 10% increase in the magnitude of it, magnitude of an event might actually correspond to, to a 100% increase in the frequency of seeing such an extreme event as defined. This is a property of uh, statistics, actually, and if you're far enough out in the what's known as the upper tail of the distribution, so the, essentially the rare part where things happen infrequently, relatively small changes in the absolute magnitude can result in very large changes in the relative rarity of that event. Uh, this is true uh, for anything that is either a Gaussian or heavy-tailed distribution, if you're a statistics nerd. Uh, but the, 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 the gist of it is that, you know, you start seeing 10, 15, 20% increases in the magnitude of events, you might actually be seeing 100 or 200% increase in the frequency of those events as observed. The problem is, for events this rare, you know, if it's a 100-year or a 200-year or a 300-year precipitation event, as some of these have been in and near San Diego and Ventura recently, at least in a stationary climate, uh, even if the odds have doubled, you'd still only expect to see them. Uh, you know, if a 300-year event becomes twice as likely, it's still a 150-year event. Or if a 100-year event becomes twice as likely, it's a 50-year event. So you still don't see them often, and you can't just rely on observations to tell you whether they're or not they're increasing, because you'd only be able to do so after a few hundred years. Uh, I don't think any of us are likely to be around in a few hundred years to know for sure. So we have to look at indirect indicators. We have to look at the science. We have to think about the physics, use climate models in, in conjunction with these observations. And all of that is to say, yes, we are seeing increasingly hints of these in, more intense uh, downpours in California and indeed really throughout much of the world in these more intense atmospheric river events, but also more intense convective downpours. Uh, and, and these are potentially uh, interactive events, and we could see more of these in this upcoming storm sequence even, as I mentioned. All right. Um, just scrolling through the comments here. still back on when there was the earthquake. So hopefully I don't scroll down and see that there was another one. Okay, so there is a question from Big Sir Kate about the predictability of an arc storm-like event. I will come back to that. It's in the back of my mind. I'm just continuing to scroll. Mary mentions that British Columbia just had a, a, an Arctic outbreak that left a lot of low elevation snow, so a Pineapple Express on top of that is not so good. That is, that is correct, and this is one of the reasons why the flood risk is even higher than it would be up there. Fortunately, that's not really the case in California. We don't have a huge low elevation snowpack. In fact, there's essentially no snow at lower elevations. That's uh, one thing we don't have uh, to worry about right now. Uh, Jack mentions that Ensenada, that in Mexico, may get uh, more than half of their average annual rainfall in like a week. That could happen, actually, so that, that is plausible. <laughs> Jeremy mentions that there's king tides again on February 9th. Uh, that's an interesting point. Let me look at what the timing of these is relative to uh, fe February 9th. Uh, the Let's see, and, uh, that looks like it might be the tail end of the storm cycle, but uh, there could still be some stuff going on, so that could, that could potentially be an issue for sure. We've been seeing those kinds of issues recently in spades. 
Okay, so while Mark is unfortunately saying that there were a couple of deaths potentially in San Diego from Monday's storm, I mean, honestly, it's also possible I just hadn't heard about them because the officials didn't know about them yet. So that, that is sad and not that surprising because, again, this, this was quite extreme flooding. There were people caught off guard and there were people who legitimately were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was a fast evolving event, so not a good outcome there. Uh, Brian mentions the storm could be another significant avalanche producer. I think, yeah, it could be. Uh, potentially the, the warm initial storm and then followed by more colder storms after that. You know, you, you get that layering, those alternating layers of uh, uh, warmer, icier, slushy snow with cold powder on top of it. And yet that, that sort of uh, encourages those ice crystals to form in ways that are not cohesive between layers. And so you get pretty significant slabs that can slide. That was essentially what happened up... I think it was up in Palisades a few weeks ago um, with the avalanche. One person died in bounds at the ski resort. Um, snow conditions are a little weird out there this year, and this, that might not be the last time something weird happens with the snow uh, this season. I'm glad that the uh, that the sessions are working better technically for people than they used to. You know, honestly, I have this cable strung way down the hall, and it really just seems like that's something I need to do. Um, it does help to the 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 computing equipment that that was crowdsourced over the summer. I think has also helped, and so uh, I appreciate it. Um, my apologies that today you have to deal with my cold, but at least the internet connectivity is pretty solid. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, from the, it sounds like the newspaper is reporting down, down uh, from Mary uh, in San Diego that no one died in the city proper, but there were folks who died uh, outside, uh, including in Santee. So the flooding wasn't just in the city of San Diego. There, it was a, over a broader region. So unfortunately, that seems to be the case. Let's see. What is the difference between the control run and any of the other 50 members? Uh, that's a reference to the ensemble and those horizontal lines that you saw. Uh, I believe that in, in the, you know, the European model ensemble that the control run is run at slightly higher spatial resolution and it is the actual unperturbed initial conditions. So that represents the best guess uh, of what the initial state of the atmosphere is. But honestly, the best guess is not necessarily more accurate than other members. So for most practical intents and purposes, I tend to treat all members, including the control run, as equally likely, except the control run can potentially be a tiebreaker uh, on short time scales, so out to three days, because that's where there's maybe a little bit of advantage in having higher spatial resolution. A uh, question from Michael, does sandbagging really do any good? Uh, it can. I mean, you're not going to hold back uh, uh, the arc storm with, with sandbags, let's just put it that way. Uh, but, you know, at, it can actually be extremely helpful at the margins. You know, if you're talking about inches of water to maybe a, maybe a foot of water, they can be really effective, especially if you don't need to deflect all of the water, if you just need to take the force out of it, if it's flowing uh, forcefully downhill and you need to hit something other than say the front of your, your home or your your business or something. It, it can take the, the some of the kinetic energy out of it, even if it doesn't keep things completely dry, it can greatly reduce the level of damage that you get and the actual amount of water that goes inside. So, And there are more sophisticated sandbag barriers. You know, you, people, there are like, tarped barriers or covers for sandbags that are actually more water impermeable up to a few feet high. Uh, you you kind of got to have a professional construction crew to install that usually. But uh, I mean, in Europe, actually, some, there's been some severe flooding in the UK recently. And they had these sandbag based walls that had essentially uh, fancy tarps and airbags over them that kept uh, a, some pretty big rivers uh, out of town. Uh, and I think some of those walls were like four to six feet tall on top of the, the riverbank. So, and they worked, they completely kept the rivers out of town. So, uh, I wouldn't count it out. 
Uh, but sometimes it takes a little more than just ordinary sandbags to achieve that. But even just ordinary sandbags, at a minimum, are going to take some of the kinetic energy out of water rushing downhill, which can be helpful. Uh, how likely is it that today's predictions will be totally inaccurate come Monday or will it likely hold? I think it's pretty likely to hold. You never know. It is a, it is a ways out. <laughs> but right now, this is a pretty strong signal as far as ensemble modeling goes for, for some very wet and stormy conditions in Southern California in particular between about February 1st and uh, 7th or so. So about a week in there. Still just reading here. Um, all right, so I, I just want to close with a few responses to questions about ArcStorm. Uh, won't be able to get to all of them. I gave you a full hour. wasn't actually planning on going all the way to the hour, but let me close with this. About to sneeze, so give me a moment. Maybe. All right, maybe not. Uh, a couple of questions about ArcStorm. One is about whether we would know in advance and how far we'd know in advance. Um, so, uh, this is an interesting scientific question that we're actually now with some partners at the Desert Research Institute looking at directly. So we might have a clearer answer to this, which will be good. But in general, uh, the kind of weather pattern, uh, a, so a, an arc storm like multi-week sequence of extremely severe storms and extremely heavy rainfall and the potential for widespread catastrophic flooding in California by by its intrinsic nature isn't something that can just pop up overnight and out, of, and out of nowhere. This would have to be a huge parade of storms out over the Pacific that would develop and strengthen as they move towards the state. And in this modern era of, uh, of essentially uh, modern satellite, uh, remote sensing observation, modern weather modeling, we just don't uh, fail to see those sorts of events coming. We might not know the magnitude of the event at the outset, but we would have very strong indications of something that was, A, looked extremely intense in the first couple of weeks. So this is one piece of the Arkstrom scenario, is it doesn't start gradually, it, it really just gets going all at once, and you start getting problems immediately that just get progressively worse. And number two, we would also see at least some indications in the medium to long term that there were vague, fuzzy uh, indications of a, of a very wet pattern continuing beyond 10 or 14 days. So we would be really confident in the initial onset that it would be quite intense. We would be less sure about the persistence of that event for the, the latter two weeks. Uh, we wouldn't really know until we were about halfway through the event that it, we were really headed for an arc storm level like event. But we would know in the first two weeks of the event uh, that we were at least in under conditions that if they continued could result in that kind of outcome. And we would be able to see it coming on that front end. Uh, we'd have, we have really good weather forecasts three to five days out now. There's, there's essentially a zero chance that this would take us by surprise more than three to five days uh, with less than three to five days of notice. And realistically, we would be able to see uh, indications seven to 10 days out of really intense conditions, of extremely wet conditions. Uh, so the, the notion that it could just, you could just wake up one morning and be underwater is, is just not true. That is one thing that makes this kind of hazard different than a, a major earthquake scenario in California or even a major wildfire in, in that, uh, you know, I am 100% certain, for example, that it won't happen tomorrow or the next day or the next day or the next day. I mean, I would literally bet anything on, on that. 
you know, as we go out to a week, to two weeks, to three weeks, would I bet literally anything that it's not going to happen? No, because, you know, technically the odds aren't literally zero more than five days in the future. But in any given winter, they, 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 they never are absolutely zero either. Uh, and so, you know, but we can essentially say with like 100% certainty in the next three to five days that it's not going to happen. And we could probably say that in any three to five day period looking forward. So now granted, there are real questions about whether three to five days or seven days or 10 days or even two weeks or three weeks would really be enough to do very much about it because we would never be 100% sure that it was coming, but we would have very strong indications that it might be. So I can tell you right now that it definitely isn't coming in the next five days. You could imagine, at, you know, at some future point where I might actually be saying, you know, this could be it, folks. This this could be the big one. Uh, we won't know until a little bit later, but I think we need to plan as if it is. Again, just so nobody takes that snippet uh, and posts it on TikTok out of context, this is a hypothetical scenario. I'm not talking about what's happening right now, but that is something that we would be able to say in that event if and when, and I do think it is a question of, of when rather than if, it eventually occurs. Um, and the last point I'll make there, well, there's two. There's one question about whether the state is prepared. It's difficult to answer that succinctly, and I'm running out of steam. So uh, suffice it to say, I think overall the answer is we are not as prepared as we should be for the risk of an extremely severe flood event, and I don't think the state has taken it as seriously as it has taken other natural hazard risks, like earthquakes and wildfires. Uh, the state is taking earthquake risks very seriously. There have been a lot of really constructive things that have happened to reduce the risks, especially in the Bay Area and in the LA Metro the last two decades. I think partly thanks to those USGS earthquake scenarios that scared the pants off of some mayors and policymakers, and then that actually ended up resulting in some good outcomes. There's a lot of buildings, a lot of public infrastructure that has been retrofitted and will probably be uh, in much better shape following the next big earthquake than it would have been in the 1970s, the 1980s. Uh, with wildfire, this has happened more recently. We kind of got shocked out of uh, our, to a certain extent, shocked out of our uh, apathy uh, the last decade or so with the wildfire risks, with the really devastating tragedies in places like Santa Rosa and Paradise and any number of other smaller communities throughout the state and throughout the West that has suffered tremendously in these catastrophic wildfires that were, were well beyond what the states had envisioned as being possible. And now we're thinking that even worse is theoretically possible under the right conditions. And we've even seen so far. And that's shaping things like emergency response and funding for mitigation and unfortunately making it really hard to get uh, home insurance in a lot of places. We have not had that conversation yet at a large scale about the mega flood risk. And one of my big sticking points, and one of the reasons why I really hope that I can find some way to remain engaged in California and the West specifically, you know, as a public facing climate scientist communicator, is that I actually think that the risk of a really big flood event is hugely un un under uh, prepared for, generally speaking. And I'm not necessarily calling out specific state agencies here, and some actually are taking it seriously, but others are not. Certain municipalities certainly aren't. And I think that we're kind of today uh, where we were with wildfire about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, blissfully naive about what uh, may come in the next couple of decades. And unfortunately, the, the, the catastrophes arrived before the preparedness did with wildfires. One of my big goals is to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, for the mega flood because we still have some time. Up until the moment that it happens, it hasn't happened yet in modern California. And if we can be more, you know, if, if we can essentially follow the earthquake approach more than the wildfire approach, if we can be uh, proactive and actually reduce the risk before the huge catastrophe occurs, we're, you know, we're going to be much better off than if we wait for the mega flood to arrive and then say, wow, we really should have done more to prepare for that because that this is really terrible. So we've gotten tastes of this, but imagine if the whole state were experiencing flooding as bad or worse than what occurred in, in, in the most inundated parts of San Diego all at once and for almost a month. And that's sort of what we're talking about with Arc Storm. And I don't think we're ready. And I don't think San Diego is ready even for this lesser and localized event. So it is an indication that there are, are a lot of places in California that probably haven't been thinking about this as much as they should have been. Uh, so how's that for an answer to these questions? Uh, 
All right. Well, uh, again, I'm going to try and recover this weekend, write a blog post Monday or Tuesday, and probably have at least one live session uh, early to mid-next week, and then maybe another one. I'll, sometimes I will do more than one a week during active periods, just like I'll do uh, less than one per week during really slow periods. So um, I know folks are interested, and I will try. Uh, I will try to keep folks up to date. So uh, on the one hand, uh, the arc storm is, is something, it's a scenario. It's not a specific weather prediction, but a, about a real world event. There, there, there is no indication of something like that on the horizon right now. On the other hand, it is something that could happen. Uh, it is physically plausible and the risks are rising in a warming climate. Now also, despite all of that, there is the risk of a, a weather pattern that could bring significant flood risk to parts of Southern and Central California in about a week or so. Uh, so very heavy rainfall is at least in the realm of possibility for parts of Southern California during this pattern that could result in flooding. So it's really too early to talk about the details, but that is something that may end up happening in, uh, sooner rather than later. And I do think it's important to be able to talk about natural hazard risks and the potential for, for lesser disasters, if you will, even if we can distinguish them from uh, the really extreme kinds of things that we know are possible but are also still rare. And even though climate change is making them more likely, they're still unlikely in any given year. And not every event is the worst case scenario. And we can't claim that they are or we're gonna lose, we would lose all credibility. So fortunately, I actually haven't seen any meteorologists or scientists falling for any of this or using any of that kind of messaging. And I've seen that the National Weather Service offices in Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego, as well as the California Office of Emergency Services, have all had to do rumor control, damage control, and myth busting over the past week in response to these uh, Twitter and TikTok viral misinformation posts uh, that I was discussing earlier. So again, thanks for joining me, uh, and I'm going to go uh, crash now. So uh, thanks, thanks for all that, and. Uh, Enjoy the warm weather before uh, the much stormier weather to come next week.